Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 295. Now, today, we got a real doozy of an episode for you guys. It's uh, actually going to be pretty intense and mind-blowing. I'm sure a lot of you have been somewhat following the latest with P. Diddy. Now, you probably have seen that his homes were raided, that he is under investigation for sex trafficking, several other things. There have been RICO investigation. Yep. Yep. Some explosive lawsuits. But I feel like the average person kind of knows this is going on, but doesn't know the details of it. And to be honest, it is absolutely going to blow your mind if you have not heard what is. What's been up with alleged. Diddy all these years? I mean, it is fucking insane. It is disgusting. It's disturbing and shocking. Yeah, just like forewarning, this is right up there with Mr. Epstein. Yeah, like it's that bad for sure. As far as the allegations go, he has not been charged with a crime as of recording this episode. But not with these crimes, but yeah, right. Well, I mean, we're going to be going through the whole history. Um, we're going to go through the latest, you know, all the different lawsuits. But we're also going to go back through his history and kind of how he got to where he is, which, I mean, even though this episode's going to be long, it's still like a brief overview. Oh, very brief. I mean, there's so, so much. Um, Lots of uh, big names as well. Lots of big names. We're going to be talking about Usher, Meek Mill, uh, Justin Bieber, J-Lo. Cassie. Cassie. And what happened to Cassie is just beyond horrific. Terrific, yeah. Um, Lil Rod, everything that he alleges. I mean, it's just insane. I could not believe it once we really dug in. Like I had heard some things and have kind of been loosely following it, but didn't realize how deep this is and how disturbing it truly is. So fair warning. And we will give some more, you know, heads up when we get to some of these more disturbing parts and kind of let you know what's what's going to come. But Sean P. Diddy Combs has been in the music industry for over 30 years working with everyone from Mariah Carey to Biggie Smalls, Usher, Justin Bieber. He's known for his outrageous parties and larger-than-life persona. But there is a much darker side to his wealth and fame, being named in several lawsuits since November of 2023, accusing him of physical abuse, sex and drug trafficking, the purchase and distribution of illegal firearms, consorting with and giving laced alcohol to minors, multiple instances of rape and sexual assault. And although not formally charged, like Josh said, these lawsuits have led to an investigation by the Southern District of New York, which culminated in massive raids of his L.A. and Miami homes. But accusations against Diddy have existed really since his career began, marring his rise to fame with connections to assault, pedophilia, and even the murders of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. So, do these accusations hold any truth? I mean, I would argue yes, but obviously we have to be careful here. This Most of what we're going on has just been alleged or what most of what we're talking about is alleged. You know, right, we need to right. protect ourselves legally here, but I think you'll have- Well, I think it, it'll come down to, let's look at the you know number of, of testimonies we have here yeah. and people's experiences and it's really hard to sit there and dismiss all of them and be like, you know, like Diddy <laughs> no, has has said himself via Instagram posts and, and other ways that everybody that's making these crazy allegations against him are just out for for fast cash. Yeah, of course. And that's what that. they're they're looking for. And maybe there's people that are doing that, but it seems like a lot of these people have very, very detailed, intricate stories involving uh all of these allegations. Um with Diddy and Mm -hmm. it's just it's hard to sit here and and, you know ignore all of them obviously yeah and I don't know I I highly doubt like why would you make some of this stuff up it's just so horrific like it's not even something the average person would even come up with you know what I mean like as a story like this yeah we just have to obviously say alleged because it's not confirmed as fact but um Suspects are and innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. All I got to say, in my opinion, P did it. So Did he done it? Yeah. That's what I, 50 I Cent would, said. That is what 50 Cent said. I didn't say that. Now, on the surface, Diddy doesn't look like our typical subject matter on this show. He has been a fixture in the music industry, and his power and fame is so legendary that it has inspired 
tons of other people to follow him, kind of as the blueprint. And he has a net worth of over $800 million, a supposedly happy family, and a hand in producing some of the most notable artists in pop and hip hop in uh, history, from Biggie Smalls to Mace to Usher to Justin Bieber. I mean, it just goes on and on. But Diddy's career has been marred with violence, backstabbing, and allegations of sexual abuse and sex trafficking. And deaths related to Diddy have gone back as far as 1991. His name is always front and center when discussing the murders of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. And he has been publicly named in at least four lawsuits alleging brutal physical assaults and sexual violence, which have kind of always been a rumor until now. In November of 2023, Diddy's ex-girlfriend and singer Cassie Ventura filed a 35-page lawsuit against Diddy alleging that he sexually assaulted her, physically abused her, forced her to engage in sexual acts uh, with male sex workers for his pleasure, demanded and provided copious amounts of drugs to her, and raped her when she tried to end the relationship. Diddy settled the day after she filed her lawsuit but it wasn't over. At least three others filed lawsuits against Diddy, um, alleging sex trafficking, rape, physical and sexual abuse, and statutory rape of minors. And while none of these were settled, and Diddy has to respond to them later this month, I mean, this is we're going to know more and more as time goes on here, but this was all before the most explosive lawsuit which happened very recently when musician Lil Rod, who produced Diddy's most recent album, filed a nearly 74-page lawsuit against Diddy, alleging that Diddy assaulted him, refused to pay him for 13 months of full-time work, and um, also forced him to solicit and traffic sex workers. Additionally, Lil Rod alleged that Diddy trafficked and distributed illegal firearms, shot people, and then paid off the police, consorted with minors who were given laced alcohol at his parties. And while Diddy did not settle the lawsuit, it led to dramatic raids of his homes, like I said, in Los Angeles and Miami, conducted by Homeland Security, which was huge news. Um, And I've watched some of the news coverage on it. None of them really get into what is truly going on here. Which they're not like they're not going to go do these raids if there's nothing. No, obviously not. They did them at the same time, too. So it makes me wonder how long they've been investigating him. Oh, f- um, to, for sure. To get to this point and why now, right? Like, I'm very curious to see what what they come up with because they took a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I mean, I we do have to say we don't technically know if Diddy is the target of these investigations. Right. It's his homes, though, and we know all of the other information that we're going to go over today. And, and there's a lot of it. That's kind of why I'm trying to zoom through because we have so much to go over. Well, even if it's not Diddy himself, it's most definitely people connected to him or people who work for him Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they did detain others that were in the home as well. So, I mean, it could be the entire organization as a whole and not just Diddy himself. And we do know that authorities searched for evidence of sex trafficking, confiscated computers, electronic equipment and firearms from his properties. But we're really getting ahead of ourselves here. We will break all of these things down for you today and give you really a comprehensive look at what is going on up until this point. But first, we kind of have to go back in time, understand where Diddy comes from in the context of his controversial rise to power. So P. Diddy was born Sean John Combs. A lot of you have probably heard of the brand Sean John. We were just looking at it. It looks like it's still sold on Amazon and at Walmart. Yeah. I haven't seen a Sean John piece in quite some time. I don't know that it's in uh, fashion anymore. Yeah, probably not. I don't know. I used to see it a lot in high school for sure. Oh, I did too, yeah. The Sean John jeans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, he was born November 4th, 1969 in the Harlem neighborhood of New York City to Janice and Melvin Combs. Janice was a model and a teacher's assistant while Melvin was a retired Air Force serviceman. And the family wasn't wealthy, and Melvin ended up having to resort to drug dealing and gang activities to support his family. As an associate of crime kingpin Frank Lucas, who was immortalized in the 2007 film American Gangster, Melvin was a street-level dealer who sold heroin across the city. By all accounts, though, Melvin, seemed, from what we know, seemed to be a good father and protected young Sean from his life of crime. The family enjoyed life in the city and sheltered Melvin's activities on the streets. That was until Melvin Combs was shot to death while sitting in his car 
on Central Park West. Melvin's murder is still unsolved to this day. Now, Janice worked multiple jobs to support her and Sean. The two of them moved to Mount Vernon, which is a suburb of New York, when he was four. Mount Vernon was where Sean really came into his own, showing early signs of his competitive edge and interest in business. Sean was an altar boy and attended the all-boys Catholic school Mount St. Michael Academy, where he excelled in academics and was well-liked by other classmates. He also played football for the academy, where his mother gave him the nickname Puff. For a few reasons. One, he would puff his chest out to look bigger and huff and puff when he didn't get his way. Which kind of makes sense the more you know about him. Sean graduated from the academy in 1987 and attended the prestigious Howard University in Washington, D.C. the following school year. And at Howard, Sean started his first business and began throwing some big parties. Sean had joined a fraternity and began hosting these weekly parties, which reportedly attracted over a thousand people. He also ran a shuttle business where attendees would pay to get picked up and dropped off from these parties. And his first year was very successful. And he really made a name for himself on campus as a young entrepreneur. And this reputation would only increase the following year. While home in Mount Vernon during his first summer vacation away from Howard, Sean linked up with childhood friend Dwight Myers. Dwight, who was rapping under the name Heavy D, had just signed a lucrative deal with the new record label Uptown Records. Sean, who majored in business administration, was interested in joining the music industry. Heavy D offered to set up a meeting between Sean and the label's founder, Andre Harrell. Andre was a protege of Clive Davis, the legendary founder of Arista Records, and he had just spun off his label to appeal to the youth market. We'll get into the rumors surrounding this later, but Andre took a keen interest in the 20-year-old Sean Combs and offered him an internship for the rest of the summer. Sean got a taste for fame by managing artists like Mary J. Blige and Joe Desi. Andre saw that Sean had a knack for the music industry and wanted to continue his internship through the school year. There was one problem, though. Janice Combs wouldn't let her son drop out of school for the internship, and Andre didn't want to let Sean go. So Sean would commute from Howard in Washington, D.C. to New York City twice a week, totaling 16 hours. Halfway through the school year, Andre offered Sean a full-time position as vice president of a r at Uptown. This decision was unprecedented as a 20-year-old intern being promoted straight to vice president within their first year at the company is still unheard of in the industry today. Of course, we'll get into the rumors surrounding this promotion because there's obviously probably some other reasons for that. But Sean was officially a big wig in the industry and began to go by his first nickname, Puff Daddy. Puff Daddy. I don't know about you, but I've always struggled with finding time to manage my finances. And at the end of a busy week, the last thing I want to do is spend time budgeting all of my expenses or tracking down customer service teams to cancel subscriptions I no longer use. But now I use Rocket Money and it does all that for me. Absolutely love Rocket Money. I've been using it for the past year and it has saved me loads of money, but it also has just made my life so much easier when it comes to managing my personal finances because Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, I have full control over my subscriptions and a clear view of my expenses. I can see all my subscriptions in one place. And if I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can help me cancel it with a few taps. I also love how the dashboard's laid out, shows me this month's spending compared to last month so I can clearly see my spending habits. It'll send me email notifications when there's an uncategorized transaction or it goes over a certain amount, which is awesome. And they'll even help you create a custom budget and keep your spending on track. Another awesome feature to Rocket Money is that they'll even try to negotiate your bills for you and can help you lower them by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. They're really there to give you back your time and also save you money. And they'll even deal with the pesky customer service for those subscriptions on your behalf. Rocket Money is over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use and cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash milehire. That's rocketmoney.com slash milehire. Seriously, try it out today at rocketmoney.com slash milehire. Puffy got to work. 
signing Craig Mack to the label as his first artist in 1991, and of course Biggie Smalls in 1992. Puffy was constantly on the lookout for new artists. He would read hype sections and local music editorials to recruit up-and-coming artists. This is how a 13-year-old usher lived with Puffy for over a year in the early 90s after his parents gave Puffy guardianship. Rumors surrounding Usher and Puffy's relationship have existed ever since, but here's a clip of Usher revealing his experience as a teenager on The Howard Stern Show. It's from August 22nd, 2016. I moved to New York City, and I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn Flavor some... Camp. Yeah, Flavor Camp! Yeah, that's camp. what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's gonna In pre- the 90s. Do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop, right? No, not really. Come I mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, and it was, <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't and, say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say you that. Didn't, <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh-huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh-huh. Biggie Smalls was there. Biggie Smalls was there. Lil Kim, Craig Mack. All know, these people all are hanging these, around. All, yeah, man. Faith Evans. Jody C, Mary okay? J. Blosh. They ain't know nothing about this shit. Oh. <laughs> I was having a good time. You know what I mean? Does he have you doing any chores? Are you doing dishes at all? I mean, to keep you humble somewhat? Or are you just like, can you stay up till four in the morning with them and party? I mean, I could. I yeah. actually stayed up longer than them. And, I, and what kind, do you have money? What's going on? I mean, I had like per diem. Yeah. I, had, I had like, you know, what like a, a living. life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to puffy camp? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> See? Hell no. Yeah. He seems kind That's of uncomfortable even oh, talking yeah. about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like he's obviously, you know, knows he's on the show and he's just trying to like play along with it. And yeah. it's Howard Stern, of course. Well, I think there's also some fear of P. Diddy there yeah, too, right? Yeah. Well, Possibly. yeah, is what he's going to out him on Howard Stern. Well, he probably knows some shit that he's done mm-hmm. and who knows what could happen. Well, this time was also when Puffy encountered his first controversy after he organized a charity celebrity basketball game at City College in Harlem. Diddy and Heavy D promoted the event, which took place inside the college gym and Boys to Men, Run DMC, Jodesi and Big Daddy Kane were among the players that were set to perform on December 28th, 1991. For this event, there were 1,200 tickets available, and this is just for seats in the gym, which had a capacity of 2,700. However, nearly 5,000 people showed up hoping to get in. The line snaked downstairs to the gym's basement, and only one security team checked tickets and frisked attendees. Nearly an hour after the game was supposed to start, The gym was already well over capacity, and Puffy's poor security decided to close the building's doors. And that's when chaos ensued. Thousands broke through windows and doors and stampeded their way into the gym. In the end, nine people were trampled to death, and at least 29 were injured. Puffy and Heavy D weren't held liable until a 1999 judge decision. Though Puffy said in 1998 that he dealt with the city college stampede, quote, every day of my life. He got right back to work, though for Uptown after that fatal event. In 1992, Biggie and Puffy had just finished recording Biggie's debut album, Ready to Die. However, Uptown's parent company thought the lyrics were too violent and refused to release the album. Puffy, staying true to his huff and puff reputation, freaked out at Uptown's offices. Andre Harrell fired Puffy in 1993. In an interview with Oprah, Puffy said, quote, So I got fired because there can't be two kings in one castle. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to Andre but I was fighting so hard. But Andre had a different telling of events. Let's take a look. So my full-time job became managing Puff, and I was doing other things. So even even when I let Puff go, for the whole time he was let go, he was always on payroll. Mm -hmm. I never stopped paying him until he found his next spot. His artists were always still getting per diem, because I didn't do it to hurt him, but I knew it was time for him to grow. And the only way he could grow was if he was going to have the same kind of corporate conversations that I was subjected to. Mm -hmm. And then he would understand what he could and could not do. And the final straw for me was when MCA wanted me to um, not put out the Biggie Smalls album because 
they didn't like the subject matter and they wanted me to tell him he's got to change his tone. And it wasn't up to me, I felt, to, to tell a generation what they could and could not do artistically. Mm -hmm. So I knew it wasn't going to work because he was coming from a new space and a new era. The Dr. Dre Chronic album that came out, and that was a major influence over music. So whereas I had Heavy D, who, who was more like uh, a, a happy, uh, female-loving, uplifting right. kind of celebratory artist, Puff's Heavy D was Biggie Smalls. Yeah. And Biggie Smalls was more like in the streets and telling street stories, and he told them well. And that was a transition in hip-hop. And big in New York. Yeah. For New York. And Biggie Smalls ended up becoming my favorite rapper of all time. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to sit there and be the one uh, confining Puff because the corporation was telling me to do that. I'm not built that way. Mm -hmm. So I told Puff, he needs to go and create his own opportunity. You red hot. I'm really letting you go to, so you can get rich. A much different version of events. <laughs> yeah, completely different. Mm -hmm. But again, this did not slow Puffy down. And by the end of 1993, Clive Davis had given Puffy his own label under Arista Records, Bad Boy. And... Rumors surround this arrangement, too, as Andre was Clive Davis's protege before, but we will get to that later. What's important now is that with his own label and offices near Times Square, Puffy immediately went to work, releasing Biggie's debut. Ready to Die was released in September of 1994 and was an immediate hit. The single Big Papa cracked the top 10 on Billboard's Hot 100 and pushed the album to platinum status. And while things were heating up for Puff and Biggie on the East Coast, West Coast label Death Row had cemented itself as a hip-hop heavyweight as well with stars like Snoop Dogg and Tupac Shakur. And with the competition coming from Bad Boy, the two record companies would duke it out for the next several years, allegedly leading to multiple murders. And by this point, Death Row's beef with Bad Boy was only commercial it was kind of a friendly competition between the two labels to see who could have the highest sales and the most popular artists. In 1994, Tupac was in New York to stand trial for the rape of Ayanna Jackson the previous year, and he had also recorded a feature verse for Biggie's debut and was sent to Quad Recording Studios to pick up his check. On November 30th, 1994, Tupac arrived at Quad and saw Bad Boy members, including Biggie, hanging out up on the balcony. And they wave to one another, and then Tupac enters the building. And while waiting for the elevator, masked men who were waiting for Tupac attacked him. They actually shot him five times before they stole over $40,000 worth of jewelry off of his body. Tupac was then rushed to the Bellevue Hospital on a stretcher, where this infamous photo was taken of him flipping off the camera. Three hours post-operation, Tupac stood trial, which is crazy. And that was where he was eventually convicted of the rape and sentenced to eight months in prison before death row CEO Shug Knight bailed him out pending an appeal in his case. Though again, we'll get into this later with all the other rumors, Tupac thought Puffy was behind the shooting and he even believed members of Bad Boy were involved with Ayanna Jackson and that they wanted revenge. In early 1995, Biggie released Who Shot Ya?, which was seen mainly as a diss track that taunted Tupac for the 1994 shooting. And a few months later, during the acceptance speech at the Source Awards in New York, Shug dissed Bad Boy and was booed off the stage. And we actually have a clip of that, too, you can check out. First of all, I'd like to thank God. Second of all, I'd like to thank my whole time, just whole family, both sides, you know what I'm saying? I'd like to tell Tupac, keep his guards up. We ride with him. One other thing I'd like to say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, and don't want to, want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to death row. So later that same year at Jermaine Dupree's birthday party at a club in Atlanta, Puffy, Jermaine, and Puffy's security guard Wolf were all together. And suddenly, Suge Knight and his best friend and bodyguard Big Jake walked in. Suge opened the door and approached Puffy and Jermaine, 
and slapped Germain across the face. Puffy's bodyguard fought them, and soon all five of them were involved in a brawl. And obviously they were kicked out, and the fight just moved outside the club. And after much yelling, Puff and Shug actually sort of reached an understanding. And for a moment, their beef ended. But just a moment. Because then across the street, shots were fired from an unknown man. Now, the first shots were likely a cover-up. While everyone was paying attention to the unknown gunman, someone shot Big Jake in the back and actually killed him. And Wolf was charged with the murder, but ultimately beat his case. However, Shug blamed Puffy for the death of his best friend, and obviously from there, the beef only got worse. After his release from prison, Tupac released Hit Him Up, which was a diss track aimed at everyone involved in Bad Boy. In it, he claimed to have had sex with Biggie's wife, Faith Evans, and threatened Puffy as well. And so in a power move, Puffy planned a Bad Boy tour for the West Coast and hired famous Southside Crip Keefe D for security. While the tour was uneventful, at the 1996 Soul Train Awards, Tupac allegedly pulled up on Puffy with hundreds of gang members. They burst backstage and Puffy allegedly hid underneath a car. Puffy, who had previously been untouchable, was now embarrassed. On September 7, 1996, Tupac and Suge were in Las Vegas for the Mike Tyson fight at the MGM Grand. Keefe D and his cousin Orlando Anderson were also in town. Orlando ran into Tupac and Suge at the casino and they got into a fight after Orlando claimed to have stolen a death row chain. After the fight, Tupac and Suge drove to a club when they stopped at a red light. Tupac leaned out of the passenger window to greet a woman shouting his name. Then a white Cadillac pulled up along the passenger side and shot multiple rounds at Tupac's car. Tupac was hit four times in the chest and died six days later from his wounds. In 2023, Keefe D was indicted for the murder of Tupac Shakur. Keefe D had admitted to being involved in the murder in 2008, but it was part of a proffer agreement, and his confession was not admissible in court. This meant that the Las Vegas Police Department had to do the entire investigation without the assistance of L.A., which is why it took so long for an official indictment. We'll get into this later, but it's often rumored that Puffy was also directly involved in Tupac's murder. And we do realize that a lot of you probably already know the details around Biggie and Tupac, but we felt like we should at least kind of go over it once again, just to to remind you, or for those of you who aren't as familiar. Well, it's kind of like a domino effect, too. You know, a lot of things... Knowing what we know now, looking back at it, it's, you know... It helps to add context for Mm -hmm, sure. mm -hmm. The year following in 97, Puffy and the rest of Bad Boy crew were invited to Soul Train Awards in LA. However, most of the artists were too scared to go fearing retaliation for Tupac. Biggie especially didn't want to go as he had just broken his femur due to a car accident and Clive Davis had set him up to go to London that night to introduce himself to an international audience. Puffy didn't know that Clive had gone around him to schedule an international press conference for his artists and he was pissed. He called Clive, screamed at him, and forced Biggie to attend the Soul Train Awards. Biggie and Puffy attended an after party at the Peterson Automobile Museum before Puffy forced Biggie to drive to Steve Stout's party in the Hollywood Hills. Rapper Mace warned them not to attend as he had seen death row affiliated cops at the Peterson party. Diddy ignored him, and the two left in separate vehicles. When Biggie's car stopped at a red light, an Impala pulled up alongside them and fired shots into the vehicle and Biggie was killed on March 9th, 1997. It's crazy as there's still no official leads into Biggie's murder to this day. And as we'll get into later, Puffy is rumored to be at the center of both the murder of Tupac and Biggie Smalls. Puffy had just lost one of his closest friends and most famous artists, and this wouldn't be the last time he made headlines for acts of violence. Puffy had hoped that the deaths of Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur would bring an end to the craziness, of the beef between Death Row and Bad Boy. In 1994, Puffy began the most intense relationship of his life with model Kim Porter. While Puffy has never married, he's had many high-profile relationships with the likes of Jennifer Lopez, Cameron Diaz, most recently Young Miami of the City Girls, and singer Cassie Ventura, who we'll get into later in more detail. Kim would last the longest, though, as the two's tumultuous relationship would be on and off again periodically up until 2007. Puffy actually adopted Kim's first son, Quincy, who she had with ex-spouse and musician, All Be Sure, and they would go on to have three other children together, Christian, or King Holmes, in 1998, and twin daughters, Delilah and Jesse, in 2006. 
Altogether, Diddy would have seven children with four different women. Justin in December 1993, his oldest daughter Chance just months before the twins in 2006, and his youngest daughter was born in December of 2022. Even with the death of their most prominent artist, Bad Boy showed no signs of slowing down. Puffy had just signed Mace, whose album Harlem World was immensely popular and started a solo career. Diddy's own album, No Way Out, went platinum after selling 3.4 million copies and winning the best rap album at the Grammys. Puffy's tribute song for Biggie, I'll Be Missing You, topped the Billboard Hot 100 for 11 weeks and won best rap performance at the Grammys. And by the end of 1997, Bad Boy Entertainment had raked in nearly $100 million in recordings. Springtime is all about fresh air, fresh starts, and freshly cleaned homes. And it's the perfect time to give a fresh look at Simply Safe Home Security, the only home security system we use and recommend. We're huge fans of Simply Safe. One of the reasons I love them so much is truly how simple their system is. It's so simple that you can even install it yourself. And I love how customizable it is for homes of all sizes. You can get a Simply Safe system customized for you. It's also trusted by experts, and Simply Safe was named Best Home Security Systems for 2024 by US News and World Report, and Newsweek awarded it Best Customer Service in Home Security, which I can attest to. I've had all the systems out there. Simply Safe's customer service is the best out there. The system blankets your whole home in protection and has sensors to detect break ins, fires, floods, and more, plus a variety of indoor and outdoor cameras to keep watch over your property or your pets day and night. It's backed by 24-7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day, so you can get fast emergency response and dispatch when you need it most. Simply Safe professional monitoring agents can even help stop crime in real time by speaking to the intruders through the wireless indoor camera. And there's some great videos out there of them doing just that. With no contract, amazing, and a 60-day money-back guarantee, so you really have nothing to lose to so try them out, you can try Simply Safe risk free. And if you don't absolutely love it, send the system back for a full refund. Simply Safe has given me and many of our listeners real peace of mind, and I want you to have it too. Get 20% off your new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. That's simplysafe.com slash mile higher because there's no safe like Simply Safe. And still, amidst all the success, Puffy couldn't help but live up to his bad boy reputation. In April of 1999, Puffy shot a music video with rapper Nas and his manager Steve Stout. Stout, the executive whose after-party Biggie was en route to before his tragic death, accommodated a last-minute request to include a scene of Puffy being crucified in the video. Now, Stout honored Puffy's request and spent $14,000 to ensure that this made it into the video. However, Puffy then consulted with his mother and his pastor and decided that he wanted the scene removed, despite it already being edited and scheduled for release. And, you know, like we said, he did him a big favor by including this last minute anyway. So Stout explained to Puff that he couldn't remove the scene anymore because the video had already been given the final cut and was slated to release, but that infuriated Puffy. Puffy showed up at Steve's office in Manhattan with two bodyguards and attacked him. Steve recalls, quote, he punched me in the face, then grabbed the phone and bashed me in the head with it. One minute I'm in the middle of a meeting and the next minute I'm down on the floor and Puffy and his guys are kicking and pounding me. One of them picks up a chair and throws it at me, then Puffy throws my desk over and they just walked out like nothing happened. Puffy also used a champagne bottle to bash Steve's head. Insanely violent. So then Puffy was arrested and faced nearly seven years of jail time if convicted of this violent assault. However, while out on bail, Puffy publicly apologized and reportedly paid Steve $500,000 to drop the assault charges. And Steve agreed, and Puffy was only sentenced to one day of anger management classes. And as time went on, that one day, it really shows. On December 27, 1999, Puffy and his new protege, Shine, had just finished recording Shine's first debut album. And to celebrate, the two joined Puffy's girlfriend 
at the time, who was Jennifer Lopez, at Club New York in Manhattan. Now, the night seemed to be a fairly ordinary night out on the town. That was until Diddy bumped into the notorious Brooklyn gangster, Matthew Scar Allen, and spilled his drink, and Scar felt disrespected and fought with Puffy and his entourage. Then one of Scar's associates threw a wad of cash at Puffy, and Puffy had to one-up them. So at 2.55 a.m., someone pulled out a gun and shot at Scar. Bullets whizzed past them and struck three people in the crowded nightclub. Thank God no, no one was killed from that, but clubgoer Natanya Rubin was hit in the nose. Shine was arrested at the scene, while Jennifer Lopez and Puffy were arrested later that morning and released on a $10,000 bail. Both Puffy and Shine were charged with weapons violation, including attempted murder. Puffy was represented by Johnny Cochran, the famous lawyer who, you know, he's really known for getting OJ acquitted during his murder trial. And in contrast, Shine was represented by Murray Richmond, who was basically unknown. Scar did not even show up to court, but released a statement stating that Shine and Puffy shot at him. So Puffy attempted to bribe his driver with $50,000 to say that the illegal firearm found on the scene was his and even allegedly bought off a witness to say that Shine committed the shooting. This witness would later go on to recant their statement, but the damage was done. After seven weeks of trial, Puffy was acquitted of all charges, while Shine was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was released on October 6, 2009, and deported to his home country of Belize. And while he only released one record with Bad Boy Entertainment, Shine became involved with the politics in Belize and even became the leader of the Belize United Democratic Party. And he did sign with Def Jam while incarcerated and released another album. Now, Natanya Rubin, the woman who was shot in the face at the nightclub, to this day claims that Puffy was the one who shot her. She sued Puffy for damages in 2008, and the two settled in 2011 for $130 million. Natanya has said that she would like the bullet fragments removed from her face so that they could be tested and traced to Diddy. Upon his acquittal, Puffy wanted to shed his bad boy reputation, and that's when he changed his name to P. Diddy. However, he had become known as something else, a cheap bastard. Because you see, Diddy is currently worth $800 million, and while most of that wealth was earned through record sales and brand partnerships with Sir Rock and Dalion Tequila, a lot of it also came from how Diddy handled his artists because Diddy would sign young artists with these super predatory contracts, often with minimal signing bonuses and no way to get royalties. Their first albums would do exceptionally well, and of course, Diddy would make a lot of money. But when it came time to record their second, Diddy would not promote it. Sales would be low enough for him to cut the artists from the label or he would just keep it in limbo when they requested a more fair contract. And he would actually charge them extreme prices to leave Bad Boy, and this would be known as the Bad Boy Curse. Craig Mack, Diddy's first signee, never released his second album after he refused to fire his old manager and hire one of Diddy's employees. Biggie was killed before the release of his second album, Life After Death. Shine was also on trial when his first album came out, and he resigned to Def Jam while in prison. Mace was also so disgusted by Diddy that after his first album, he straight up left the industry and became a pastor. However, he would release two more albums under Bad Boy to satisfy his contract, but Diddy responded that it was actually Mace who owed him $3 million, and Black Rob, whose single Woe, charted at number 43 on the Billboard Hot 100, actually died while homeless in 2021. Rap supergroup The Locks, made up of Sheik Louch, Styles P, and Jada Kiss, was signed for $25,000 and no royalties. And when they tried to renegotiate their contract after the success of their first album, Diddy, of course, refused. He even wanted to give them a signing bonus of, get this, no money, just matching Air Force One sneakers. What a deal. The Locks paid Diddy $3 million just to be released from their contract with Bad Boy and re-signed to Rough Riders. Diddy received half of their royalties for years, even after they had re-signed to a new label. And here's a clip of Diddy and the Locks arguing about the contract on live radio. Well, I saw you 
I told you, let's get together, let's talk. You know what I'm saying? I told you I'm accessible. I said, if anything don't come, if, 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 if there's somebody standing in the way for you expressing yourself, or any of y'all expressing yourself, y'all can come get at me directly. You know what I'm saying? Come All that going to refrigerate and you going to kill, no, y'all yeah. ain't killing nobody, man. You know what I'm saying? We, we businessmen. We all mature adults say all that right there. I'm at my office. Y'all can sit on this interview with her and talk as long as y'all want to talk about it. You can take the invitation I gave you before. But it's not even getting there because of your, your, your get on the radio, whatever tactics. I ain't your enemy. Dog, we just... I ain't your enemy. Just, you just, need to bang like that dog, on dog, cats that's coming yo, at you. I ain't your enemy. Just yesterday, we got, a, just yesterday we got somebody. a note you need to from kill your somebody. office about killing saying you. you don't have no idea of none of this or none of nothing. Just yesterday, your lawyer told us that. I, I see you at the whole, at the show backstage. You, you said find out me, what man. it was. I'll let me, but, but don't don't sit here and portray like Puff took nothing from y'all. What is it? This? What is it? What are you calling? What are you calling? What are you calling? And don't say we can come in your office or do none of that because we can't do none of that. You gonna, you gonna we can't talk? handle it no other way What'd but with lawyers, and you know that, so don't get on the radio and act like a tough guy or hey, none of that. Wait, 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 wait. You know how we can settle You that? acting I'm tough. In my office. So why don't we stop talking on the radio? Now, you no, want no, people to stop talking talk because you just don't want to know the no, truth, dog. Like we made one record with you. I Money and our I respect. It's 10 years later, and you still got half of our publishing. And now, there's no way you can make it justifiable man, that you, 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 you deserve half of our publishing. You to my face. We just have the concert. You ain't saying nothing. What are we going to do, Shave it Puff, to your you face, told so? What do you, you want us to do? This. We can't touch. We, uh, it's not a, we can't be violent. Oh, none of that. Oh, we can't even have saying this, this dog two years ago. Check, check, check. That was in you Miami. Let's do let, 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 real. Y'all know where the office is at. There's a big sign on it. I'm going to be here. The whole national guard is downstairs, too. Cut it out. I'm going to get caught up in this. I'm a grown-ass man, man. You're a coward. I don't take nothing. You're a You're a coward. Don't say you're All right. Wow. He is a coward. I know so many of you out there will relate to me when it comes to experiencing dressing room trauma in your past. I hate, hate, double hate, loathe entirely going to the mall and going in the dressing rooms. I had so many traumatic experiences in dressing rooms when I was growing up. And to this day, I just absolutely hate it. So that's why I love Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix sends styles so good that you can feel it. They deliver all the confidence that comes with a truly amazing outfit without any of the work. You guys know I truly love Stitch Fix. I have been a paying customer of Stitch Fix for years now, and I have gotten so many of my favorite pieces through them. And the longer I've been doing it, the more my stylist knows my style, what I'm gonna like and what I'm not gonna like. So it's just gotten more tailored to me. And you all know that amazing confidence boost you get when you put on a really great outfit. That's what I get from Stitch Fix. And when I look good, I feel good. And it couldn't be easier. You just give your stylist your size, your style, your budget preferences. And I order boxes when I want and how I want. There's no subscription required. I can adjust how often I get them whenever I want. Normally, I prefer to get them like every three weeks. And they send five just for me pieces plus outfit recommendations and pro styling tips. I keep what I love and I send back the rest. It is so easy because they even send you a prepaid labeled bag. You just throw everything in and stick it in the mailbox. And I love that when I have an event coming up or a trip coming up or I want more of a specific type of piece, maybe I'm just looking for tops that month, I can completely customize what I'm looking for and get just that. And if you don't love something in your box, you just send it back. Shipping returns and exchanges are always free. And like I said, it couldn't be easier to make those returns. It's style that makes you feel as good as you look. You can get started today at stitchfix.com slash mile higher. That's stitchfix.com slash mile higher, stitchfix.com slash mile higher. So after losing most of its high-profile artists in the late 90s and early 2000s, Bad Boy needed some help. Diddy had started his infamous MTV reality show Making the Band and had signed acts out of it. But the same thing happened. The first album was acclaimed, and the second one never came or just simply flopped. Then in 2006, Diddy heard Cassie Ventura's first single, Me and You, a great song that many of us have heard. I loved that song. Really good. I wish we could play it for you if you haven't heard it, but look it up. I if think you most people know it. It was huge. Well, Diddy heard it while at a club in New Jersey, and the song was a hit in Europe and found its way through the club scene in New York. Diddy immediately signed Cassie when she was 19 and he was 38. And then the two entered into a decade-long relationship. 
and we'll discuss their relationship in depth soon, but it was tumultuous, to say the least. The two were on and off, and Diddy fathered children with other women, and Cassie's career suffered. Her first album is credited with revitalizing Bad Boy, but after that, her career deflated, as her second album kept getting put off until her singles were released to an underwhelming reception. The relationship officially ended in 2018, and Cassie completely split from Bad Boy after they broke it off. And remember when we said that Diddy tried to shed his violent Bad Boy persona? Yeah, that didn't happen either. In 2015, while Justin Combs was attending UCLA, Diddy was charged with assault with a deadly weapon after the football coach just yelled at his son. Diddy told him he couldn't speak to his son that way, to which the coach responded, quote, I'm here, he's my player. Diddy allegedly fought the coach and ended it after he swung a kettlebell at the coach's head. So Diddy's clearly just violent and unhinged. The two settled out of court, of course, and the DA dropped criminal charges against Diddy. Suge Knight, Diddy's former rival, was convicted of voluntary manslaughter for the 2015 killing of record producer Terry Kennedy with his car. Witnesses claim that Suge did it intentionally, and Suge won't be eligible for parole until 2034. Then in November 2018, Kim Porter died after a sudden bout of low bar pneumonia. Diddy said that her final words to him were, quote, take care of my babies. Her death is suspicious, but it's only rumors, so we'll look into that later as well. What's important to note is that to this day, Diddy refers to Kim as the love of his life. In 2017, Diddy's former chef, Cindy Ruella, sued him. Cindy claimed sexual harassment and failure to pay overtime. Diddy allegedly forced Cindy to work long hours and travel for weeks at a time, all without extra pay. And then it gets even worse. He would allegedly request her to serve him breakfast while he was having sex and would often see the mogul and other male guests naked. They settled two years later for an undisclosed amount. Things remained relatively quiet for Diddy in the years following Kim's death. Bad Boy lost more artists, and only five people remained signed to the label, including Diddy himself and his sons Christian and Quincy. To increase his wealth, Diddy turned to more brand merchandising deals and created the Revolt TV network. Then in 2022, New York State passed the Adult Survivors Act, which created a one year window for survivors of sexual offenses to file civil suits against their perpetrators, even if it was outside of the statute of limitations. And this is the act that led to Trump being found liable for sexually abusing columnist E. Jean Carroll in 1996. Carroll was awarded $5 million, and the suit was settled. Diddy seemed to avoid any new lawsuits, even though rumors had long surrounded his sexual behaviors. Then on November 16th, 2023, Diddy's ex-girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, filed a 35-page civil suit against the producer. In the lawsuit, Cassie alleged Diddy not only raped her in her own home, but also beat her on numerous occasions, blew up Kid Cudi's car, tried to kill Suge Knight, and most notably, forced her to engage in sex acts with male sex workers while he subdued her with a litany of drugs. This lawsuit details their early days. In February 2006, Diddy signed Cassie to a 10-album deal, and her first self-titled album debuted at number 4 on Billboard 200. Cassie was nervous in the early press for the album. Diddy said, quote, You could hear the nervousness in her voice. And to be honest, I kind of smiled at it because it made me really appreciate what I really loved about her. She's a regular person. It made me, to be honest, you've got to understand that success for her is coming out of nowhere. It's just so huge, and sometimes everybody handles it differently. This statement denoted an early, paternalistic relationship between the two, as Diddy allegedly wanted to be her guardian, or rather, just have control over her. In November 2006, Diddy invited Cassie to perform his song, Come to Me, alongside him at the MTV Europe Awards in Copenhagen. Diddy walked around their hotel in a robe with a drink in his hand, showing off his lavish party lifestyle. And during hair and makeup before the performance, Cassie's hairstylist told Cassie, that Diddy was interested in her. Given their considerable age gap, Cassie chalked it up to gossip, but was disgusted. Diddy inserted himself into Cassie's personal life soon after. He invited himself to her 21st birthday and showed up with a celebrity entourage. Although Diddy was publicly dating Kim Porter and Cassie had a relationship of her own, this didn't stop Diddy from pursuing her. At the after party for Cassie's 21st birthday, Diddy allegedly pulled Cassie into a bathroom and forcibly kissed her. Cassie did not consent and ran out crying. She only told her best friend because she was too scared to tell anyone else. The following day, 
Diddy, Cassie, and her boyfriend sat at the same table at the VMAs. Diddy got angry and yelled at them, saying that the invitation was only for Cassie, so clearly pissed that her boyfriend was there as well. And again, this didn't stop Diddy from pursuing Cassie. One night in September 2007, Cassie agreed to go clubbing with Diddy in New York. Allegedly, Diddy arrived to pick her up at her apartment, and Cassie was surprised to find out that Diddy was already extremely drunk. Once she got into his car, Diddy allegedly handed her a pill and told her to take it. Diddy refused to tell her what it was, and she later learned it was ecstasy. Diddy drove recklessly down the West Side Highway, swerving between lanes and speeding. Cassie was scared but knew Diddy's rage and didn't object. They attempted to enter the club they were going to, but security wouldn't let Diddy in because he was so belligerent. Cassie left and Diddy messaged her incessantly all night saying she had left him high and alone. Cassie wouldn't go out with Diddy without her boyfriend, so Diddy devised a plan. Allegedly, he created a fake flyer for a party that was to be hosted by Cassie in Miami. As an employee of Bad Boy Entertainment, Cassie felt obligated to represent the label. But in reality, Diddy just wanted to get Cassie away from her boyfriend. Yeah. Now, it's... I mean, all of this so far is pretty disturbing, but just fair warning, trigger warning before we go forward It only gets here, worse it gets, from here. It gets a lot worse. It's, it's very upsetting. We're going to be talking about, you know, forcing her to do drugs and physically beating her, um, yeah, just the, horrible sexual Straight up domestic acts. violence and Yeah, it's really bad. So sexual pers- abuse. proceed with caution. Yeah. So on the trip, Diddy allegedly gave Cassie copious amounts of drugs, intoxicating her more than she ever had been. Cassie felt like she couldn't refuse Diddy since her career was in his hands. So there's that power dynamic. And he kept giving her drugs until they had sex for the first time. Diddy then flexed his financial control over Cassie as he paid for, you know, lavish vacations, a Jaguar car, and multiple apartments and homes in New York and Los Angeles. All, of course, were in walking distance of Diddy's houses. Diddy maintained financial, professional, and sexual control over Cassie's life. And to ensure this, he gave her drugs to keep her intoxicated and submissive, having pills and other medications, which Cassie alleged were just out in the open. And she, quote, said that it was just like candy all around. Cassie alleged that at first she was given prescriptions that Diddy received from a doctor in Miami, but when he used up all of his supply, he demanded that Cassie acquire her own prescriptions through the same doctor in Miami to maintain his addiction. This is also when Diddy began to control her medical records, which is unbelievable, because he would have them sent directly to his email. And when Cassie experienced memory loss due to the drug use and alleged severe beatings, that he would go on to give her, and we'll get more into that. She had an MRI scan completed, and the results were sent directly to Diddy, and she never even got to see them. He later asked Cassie what she called her grandfather, and she said, quote, Pop Pop. And then Diddy asked her to call him by that name. And on at least two occasions, Diddy allegedly demanded that Cassie carry his gun in her purse without a clear reason, but Cassie believes it was you know, for him to assert his power over her and to show her that he's violent, powerful, and dangerous. Throughout their relationship, Diddy would allegedly violently beat Cassie and left bruises all over her body. After every instance, Diddy would use his power and staff to hide the evidence, keeping Cassie locked in a hotel or in his home until the bruises went away. And we will get more into that in detail here in a bit. But the first time was after a party with Jay-Z when Cassie spoke to another man. Cassie alleges that Diddy beat her violently while in an Escalade before he pushed her out of the vehicle onto Fifth Avenue and she had to walk home just totally distraught, crying all the way to her apartment. And she stayed there for three days after she realized there was no one she could tell about it. It's just so incredibly sad, everything that went down with her. And like we said, it just gets worse. So in January of 2009, Diddy learned that Cassie spoke to another music manager at a party in Los Angeles while they rode in a car together. And Diddy then allegedly pushed Cassie into the corner of the vehicle and stomped on her face. Diddy's security tried, tried, to stop the beating but couldn't de-escalate. Allegedly, when they arrived at Diddy's home, Cassie tried to run away, but Diddy chased her, pushed her to the ground, and continued to stomp her face. 
Cassie was brought into the house and vomited following this violent assault. And when Diddy realized the damage that he had done, he demanded that his staff place Cassie in the London Hotel, where she was not allowed to leave for an entire week. Cassie realized that Diddy's staff were not only aware of the alleged violence that he committed, but were essentially covering it up. And Cassie felt like if she went to the authorities, Diddy would only buy them off and give him another reason to hurt her. So obviously she's feeling like completely trapped at this point and totally in over her head, being drugged. I mean, it's just horrendous. And within the first few months of their relationship, Diddy allegedly forced Cassie to engage in sex trafficking. He wanted to watch as Cassie had sex with other men while Diddy masturbated. Now, I'm not sure. I think many of you out there may have heard this part of it. I know this has been widely reported and discussed on the internet these events that he would do. But the first time that this occurred, Diddy allegedly hired a male sex worker to come to his home in Los Angeles. And then the three of them wore masquerade masks and ingested drugs. And Diddy directed them to do different acts, filmed them while he masturbated. And this first encounter lasted multiple days. Now, Diddy would call these arrangements, these events, I don't even know what to call them. He would call them freak offs. And he would want them all the time and would randomly tell Cassie when he wanted one. And she became expected to hire the sex worker, facilitate the location, and he insisted on having these weekly and repeatedly told Cassie that it was, quote, our secret. Diddy would also allegedly get violent during these freak offs and was charged tens of thousands of dollars after destroying a hotel room at the Intercontinental Hotel in New York City. And if Diddy liked a particular sex worker, he would allegedly fly them across the country or even overseas. And his staff would help facilitate all of this by providing drugs to the various hotel suites. Diddy allegedly forced Cassie and the sex worker to take vast amounts of drugs, including ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and alcohol. And Cassie not only took them because Diddy demanded, but also because it would allow her to sort of disassociate while the freak-offs were occurring. It became common for Cassie to get hooked up to an IV drip after a freak-off to recover. That's how intense this was. And, And keep in mind, this is happening pretty much on a weekly basis, possibly even more. Cassie alleged that Diddy recorded almost all of these encounters and began treating them like an art project. If Cassie deleted a video of a freak-off, Diddy would clarify that he not only retained all of them, but could also recover those deleted videos. And one time, they're on a flight, and Cassie had deleted a video. So Diddy allegedly showed her that he had recovered it and then forced her to watch it. And during some of these freak-offs, Diddy allegedly beat Cassie in front of the sex worker and then would give her a gift to make up for it. He had given her so many designer bracelets that she began to feel, quote, shackled by his gifts. And any suggestion that Cassie could refuse a freak off or report his abuse would lead to Diddy saying that she, quote, had a lot to lose. He allegedly wouldn't even work on her second album without having a freak off before a recording, you know, before a studio session. And in August of 2015, during a surprise party for Cassie's 29th birthday, Diddy requested a freak off in the middle of the party and they had to leave immediately. Cassie refused and Diddy allegedly cornered her with his security until she agreed. After the freak off, Cassie and Diddy returned to the hotel room where her friends were already hanging out. Diddy was irritated by what one of her friends had said and he grabbed her, brought her to the balcony. This is so insane. But then he dangled her by her ankles from the 17th floor hotel suite. And what's crazy is Cassie at this point was so sedated from the drugs during the freak off that she didn't even respond. Wow, that says so much. I know, it's it's, it's horrifying. Mind-blowing. So here's a clip of Tiffany Red, who is one of Cassie's friends speaking about the abuse. Oh, he's standing in the like living room area and she's there. And he was like emotional singing there you are. And I just was like, oh, he's talking to me. And I remember like, I don't know if you know his, his, what his voice sounds like, but like 
I felt like I was in the presence of his monster inside. And I remember like looking in his eyes and I said to him, what did y'all do? Because I could see that she was like really sedated. That was the first time I ever seen her like high before. And then he says, tell your girl she wants some birthday. And we were like, well, I mean, he's saying this to me and I'm like, well, she doesn't have to have sex with you if she doesn't want to. He was upset, like, you know, I guess sh that she didn't want to do with him whatever she, whatever he wanted. I don't know. I don't feel like I could advocate for myself in that moment. Like, I realized, like, oh, this guy is dangerous. It's just, it's so hard to to think that this is not true. You know what I mean? Like, just the stories are so detailed and so, yeah. I mean, <sighs> Yeah, just, I mean, there's no way. Again, we have to say alleged because right. it's just at this point, it's not proven. But it's, I mean, I believe her 100. percent I believe her, especially all these other friends coming out and and knowing everything else we know about him. All of these things make sense, and it's so detailed, right? Right. Yeah, that's what I keep going back to. Is that oh, it's just too detailed to not be true. It's so sad, and I felt this way with the recent Quiet on Set documentary. Looking back at, you know, myself listening to her song and to some of Diddy's music back in the day, although he really sucks and none of it really stays in my mind, but to not know that any of this was going on and, you know, seeing these people on TV and public appearances, award shows, and, and have no idea the types of things that were happening, it's it just... God, it makes you wonder what we're seeing right now and the things we don't know. That will come out right, later. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's the kind of reality of just the celebrity world is that we, it's easy to forget that they're, you know, real human beings. It's not just like machines, you know, operating and that there's, there's real things going on behind the scenes. They, the mm -hmm. real people that have, you know, real experiences and to also find out that those that many of us looked up to or, you know, found inspiration from in various mm -hmm. different ways. I mean, from a, if you look at Diddy from like a business standpoint, I mean, I don't know, you can't really like, when you know everything that we know now, it's hard yeah. to like give many props for that. But like that, as a, yeah. yeah, young entrepreneur and, you know, he worked his way up the ladder and stuff. And yeah, I'm sure there's you know, plenty of people out there who felt inspired by him or, you know, but without knowing the blueprint, the really. dark side of it, yeah, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, it's yeah, he's uh, you know, he worked really hard and and did all this, built this, all this wealth up. But then when you actually know the truth about it, it's just so earth shattering to find out, oh, it was at the expense of all these yeah. all these people, and and we find this out about so many celebrities, oftentimes celebrities that we love. Like think about all of the people over the years that people have adored, and then we find out these horrendous things about them. And that's what makes me hesitant to really like idolize anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, you really never know what's going on behind the scenes. Well, and I think there's always been like rumors imagine. of yeah. stuff going on behind the scenes, but to find out that those rumors were true. Possibly, allegedly. Um, not not about yeah. not I'm not talking about this. Yeah, I'm talking in about, other cases, yeah. In other yep. cases, I'm talking mm -hmm. about like Brian Peck and talking yep. about uh you know Weinstein and all these other other things where it's like just had no idea the absolute horror and evil yep. that exists in especially in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. is shocking and just kind of I don't know makes me just not want to support it anymore right. you know like it's just question everything like, is there anybody good out there? Is there I anybody? Because, I mean, this is so random and, and definitely not to this level at all. But I always think about Ellen. I was, like, such a huge fan of Ellen for so long. And then all this information came out about just how, like, <laughs> shitty of a person she really was through all these times where I thought she was, like, the best person on the planet. Do you think, I think it brings up a interesting question of why is this happening? Why is there this systemic issue going on? Is Do you think it's the... Are these people inherently bad people and the money and fame enables them to be this way? And, you know, these deep rooted things they have within themselves is just, it's, 
you know, they kind of succumb to the the impulse, to the desire, to the temptation because they have so much wealth, control, and money? Or is it, and that's just who they've been from day one? Or is this just the atmosphere? Are they a product of their environment? Is it because they got into an art and a cesspool that already existed that they're all of a sudden influenced by that environment and then become evil? Personally, I feel like it's a mix of both. I think there are some people who have these things deep within them and they are drawn to this lifestyle of money and fame and notoriety for a reason. Um, and then it just gets exacerbated once like the longer they're in it. But then I, I do think that some people go into it and then they're just influenced. And when you're around this whole world, and this culture and Hollywood is just so evil. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you can really like say there's one recipe for every person. I think it depends on the individual. Yeah, I, I think that's the right answer. I mean, there's no way to know who, you know, who's evil and who's not from right. day one necessarily. But, but I do think the industry can attract evil people. And it, it makes me wonder where it all started. Like when did, like when they decided to start making, you know, when the music industry started and when the, the film industry started, was there ever like a period where it was like clean and pure and dude, I don't think so. Or was it just like this from the very beginning and it's just gotten worse as time's gone on and I mean everything we have found out about uh, even some of the earliest artists and early movie production, going back to like the Wizard of Oz and I, I think I think evil just lives in Hollywood and kind of always has. I think it's gotten worse. Yeah, I and know. I well, I think it's it's because those industries foster the this unbalance of of power. Yeah. And where a a select few people control the entire thing essentially, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. the the record the record label owners, you know, producers and directors and in Hollywood, I think they just have so much control over the industry that if you don't fall in line with what they want then yeah. they just boot you out and then your hopes and dreams are are shattered all these sacrifices you have to make and i mean there are definitely some theories beyond that and which is why you should support and all that and i don't know I which don't is know. why you should support independent artists independent musicians and record labels i'm a mm-hmm. big fan of because I think I, if you can be successful as an independent recording artist, that says a lot about you, I think. Yeah, I agree. Janelle, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, the only thing I was going to talk about is just, like, if you look at the music industry or just Hollywood as, in general, it's all about money at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And I think people perhaps go into it with good intentions, but once you know, millions of dollars is brought in, I think it kind of just washes away people's morals and values and they start to like see this kind of like gray area. And I think it's almost like a domino effect of once you do something kind of shady and you get away with it, it's like, okay, well, what's another thing? And then what's another thing? And then before you know it, you're just spiraling essentially. And I think it's also the the draw of fame. Like people just can't get enough notoriety and want to be bigger than anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's also that competition of like my direct, yeah, my direct competition is doing X, Y, and Z. I need to make sure that I do that times two in order to stay ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'll fall behind and potentially lose my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a horrible industry, man. The more I learn about it, I mean, the, that one Bible verse is very, very true. Bring it in the Bible. Yeah. First Timothy. What's that? Chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, agreed. Which is while some coveted after they have erred from their faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Mm. Yep. If you look at it, if you you could you That's could hilarious go, as televangelists are like out here on jets oh, I know, <laughs> reading <right>? the Bible. <laughs> like, God. I know, it's so true. I mean we're I, all so backwards, it's <laughs> fucked up. Who fucking introduced money? They really fucked the world up. Who introduced money? <laughs> Where did money come from? Well, like, before money was It was trading. Yeah, but yeah. still you had this great 
material and I want it. Yep. It's mm-hmm. greed. So it really just comes back to greed. We're greed greedy, greedy yeah. creatures, I guess. Mm-hmm. We're like Gollum. Yeah. Just we want what we want. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad that money has consumed our society and virtually every industry at this point, our politics. Oh, yeah. God, that's a lot our, of our lives, our daily lives are driven by money, mm-hmm. whether we like it or not, because yeah. we require money to survive. Yep. They've literally set it up to where you can't not have that as like your top priority. Yep. No. Like people are like, oh, money doesn't buy happiness. And like, I think to some degree that's true, but I think you, I think you're lying to yourself if you really say that and really believe it because it's like, well, it buys security, it buys peace, freedom. it buys freedom, and those things do really help with happiness. So it's like we're in a society where you, there's really like there's no way around around it. Yeah. Yeah, unless you like go completely off grid. I mean, there's some people I think that truly live money doesn't buy happiness that to them they just they don't need more and more money to become more happy, right? Like but they, need they it, have they, the essentials. But, but they like needed enough. money to get like, that. Yes, it has to, to some degree. And yeah. it has to s- sustain that. Yeah, but I th- I truly believe that some of the richest people out there are some of the most unhappy. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it, it buys like mental health or anything like that. No, 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 um, I know what you mean. But it definitely buys freedom and yeah. financial stress is known as one of the, the biggest and most intense stressors that someone can deal with and if you have let's say all of a sudden you're diagnosed with a horrible health condition well if you have hella money to get the best care like that yeah. is obviously you got a huge advantage versus someone who doesn't um no absolutely you know, with anything school yep. raising kids yep your housing anything yeah that's so true and also if you want to like make a difference in your community and start a business or start a nonprofit or um, make donations. Like, yeah, you need what do you need do for that. that money? Yep. It's, it's very true. Kind of getting off topic here, but yeah, sorry. No, no, you're good. I think it's an interesting conversation. It really ties into all of this stuff, but let's get back to Cassie. Yeah. So whenever Cassie would try to leave the relationship, Diddy would use his staff and threats of violence to make her return. Diddy returned from a trip and demanded a freak-off with Cassie, which she agreed to, and during the freak-off, he went through her phone and discovered messages between her and Kid Cudi, whom she had briefly dated while the two were apart. Diddy became infuriated and allegedly lunged at her with a corkscrew. Cassie ran out of the room where she was stopped by Diddy's staff, who told her just to talk to him. When she returned, he hit her several times and kicked her in the back as she ran out the door. Cassie flew to her parents' home in Connecticut where they photographed the bruises on her body. In February 2012, Cassie alleged that Diddy wanted to blow up Kid Cudi's car and make sure his friends were around to witness it. And guess what? A few days later, Kid Cudi's car exploded in the driveway. Yep. Crazy. So insane. At another party, Cassie spoke to a famous music manager in a hotel suite in Las Vegas, and Diddy saw her talking to this man and told her to meet him in the adjoining room. He allegedly beat her severely. She ran to the bathroom and tried to lock the door, but he forced his way through. He then punched and kicked her while she curled up next to the toilet. The loud music in the other room covered up her cries, and when Diddy's head of security saw Cassie after the assault, he cried. She had two black eyes, a burst and bruised lip, and a massive welt on her forehead. Did he then force Cassie to stay at his home until her wounds healed, or one of his sons was also living there at the time? While there, he FaceTimed her and told her, quote, you gotta go up and put more makeup on. My son can't see you like that. Which is just so fucked. Allegedly in March 2016, during a freak-off, did he punch Cassie in the face. As did he slept, she tried to leave, but he woke up, and he chased her into the hallway and threw a glass vase at her as she got on the elevator. Cassie left, but fearful of his retaliation, returned to the hotel to apologize. The hotel staff stopped her in the lobby and urged her to leave. It is believed that Diddy paid the hotel $50,000 for the security footage from that evening, which is nuts. I mean, he's just, he's using that money to keep himself out of trouble and paying everybody off that he can. He has for so long. Talk about needing it as a, I mean, there's a motive for money. Sad that when you have that kind of money, you can make a lot of people bend to it. Mm-hmm. You know, even, even this the hotel, the police. Yeah, it's just yeah, that's the people's world morals in. go out the window. Like, oh, this woman got 
got beat. This well, guy should be in trouble. Nah, well, I'll like, take the money. Diddy's behavior just continued to get worse and worse and worse over the time. And that's because he kept getting away with it. He kept right. being able to pay people off and just move on. And so he's like, I'm untouchable. And that's what he thinks today. I, th- I think he still <laughs> literally. Thinks I think that he today. literally he thinks, thinks he nothing's going to happen yeah. to me. Which, yeah, what fucking hope. Well, once you get away with all this shit for years, you have yep. this like invincible feeling to you. Absolutely. And he knows he has so much fucking money. He can pay off whoever. He's done it a million times. Yep. And to be so honest, that might happen. Like, yeah. It could. After all of this, I mean, I'm sure he'll get arrested and whatever, but like. Will he go to prison? I don't know, dude. I. I guess I wouldn't be totally shocked if he ended up getting out of it somehow. Well, he may be able to get out of this next, this latest lawsuit yeah. uh, with Lil Rod, which we'll get more into. Yeah. But I mean, he does have a massive investigation going. No, on. absolutely, like, who knows? for sure. But... but we don't even know if it's about him. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're not completely sure. It could sure. be his business. It could be his which associates. If you're, if you're confused, we will explain all of that later. Let Let's keep on track. We're getting there's just so much. It's so insane how it how really extensive is. all of this is. Cassie ended up hiding at a friend's house in Florida, but James Cruz, president of Bad Boy Management, tracked her down and told her they would not release her single she didn't call Diddy back. So again, leveraging their control over her. Diddy attacked her friends as well, settling a lawsuit with Carrie Morgan after he showed up at her home unannounced and threw a hanger at her head. In 2018, during a dinner where Cassie thought they would end the relationship for good, Diddy drove Cassie to her home. Allegedly, Diddy forced himself inside and raped her. After this, Cassie cut all ties with Diddy. She sold the Jaguar he bought her, left the homes he paid for, and ended her record deal with Bad Boy. After filing the lawsuit, Diddy settled the next day with Cassie for a reported $30 million. Cassie is living happily now after kicking the drug addiction Diddy had forced onto her, and she married professional bull rider Alex Fine in 2019 and has two children with him. And I'm so happy for her that she seems like she's, you know, living her best life now and, you know, has a family and uh, a loving husband, which is great. In the weeks following Cassie's lawsuit, three other civil suits were filed against Diddy alleging sexual assault, sex trafficking, and statutory rape. Joy Dickerson Neal filed her civil lawsuit against Diddy on November 23rd, 2023, one day before the year-long Adult Survivors Act window closed. She claimed that Diddy drugged and sexually assaulted her in 1991 when she was a Syracuse University student who appeared in a music video alongside Diddy. Diddy allegedly filmed the assault and showed it to others. Diddy did not settle this suit. His response is due April 12th, so two days after recording this episode. Filed on the same day, Liza Gardner sued Diddy and musician Aaron Hall for battery and sexual assault that took place in 1990 when Liza was 16 years old. But Liza alleged that they gave her laced alcoholic drinks before Diddy forced her into having sex. The following day, Diddy allegedly attacked and choked her until she passed out. Diddy then took to Instagram after this lawsuit was filed and did not settle. And his Instagram post says, Enough is enough. For the last couple weeks, I've sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation, and my legacy. Sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Let me be absolutely clear. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. Sean Diddy Combs. Then an anonymous woman filed a federal lawsuit in the Southern District of New York, alleging that Diddy, former president of Bad Boy, Harvey Pierre, and an unnamed third assailant trafficked her on a private plane and gang raped her when she was just 17 years old. Diddy said that since this was filed after the window of the Adult Survivors Act closed, it should be thrown out. Just as things started to quiet down for Diddy, the most explosive lawsuit, which Kendall just mentioned, was filed. So that brings us to everything going on recently with Lil Rod. On February 26th, 2024, music producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones Jr. filed a very detailed 73-page lawsuit against Diddy, Justin Combs, CEO of Universal Music Group, uh, Lucian Grange, former CEO of Motown Records, Ethiopia, Habtimerium, Diddy's chief of staff, Christina Corum, Chalice Recording Studios, and Combs enterprises as co-conspirators in operating a racketeering enterprise that allowed for sex and drug trafficking, sexual abuse, theft of work, violent assault, unconsented video recordings of sexual acts, usage and distribution of illegal firearms, and the statutory rape of minors who were given laced alcoholic beverages. Lil Rod, a little background on him, was born in Chicago 
On May 2nd, 1985, he was entrenched in the church and came from a long line of gospel musicians. He learned how to play guitar at age 13 and actually taught himself to play 13 other instruments. Pretty impressive. In August of 2022, Lil Rod received a phone call from Diddy requesting that he produce several songs for Diddy's upcoming album, The Love Album, Off the Grid. Lil Rod lived and traveled with Diddy from September of 2022 to November of 2023, so 13 months, and produced nine songs for the album. During this time with Diddy, he requested that Lil Rod record everything, leaving him with hundreds of hours of video evidence that support his claims. Lil Rod claims to have irrefutable evidence of the acquisition, use, and distribution of ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms. He also had footage of illegal firearms, sex trafficking, Diddy's son Christian sexually assaulting a woman, young Miami's cousin sexually assaulting Lil Rod, actor Cuba Gooding Jr. sexually harassing and assaulting Lil Rod, an unnamed rapper who is described as a Philadelphia rapper known for dating Nicki Minaj, so we assume it's probably Meek Mill, seems pretty obvious, consorting with underage girls and sex workers, and an unnamed singer who is described as a Grammy award-winning R&B singer who had trouble with law enforcement after assaulting a Bahin billionaire. Guess you can probably guess who that is. So obviously we think it's probably Chris Brown. Seems pretty obvious. But doing the same while at parties hosted by Diddy. On September 12th, 2022, Diddy held a writers and producers camp at the Chalice Recording Studio in Los Angeles. Diddy, Lil Rod, Justin Combs, and Justin's friend G attended the camp. And late into the evening, Diddy, Justin, and G got into a heated argument. The three moved into the bathroom and continued to argue. Lil Rod was approximately two feet away from the bathroom when shots allegedly rang out from inside. Justin and Diddy exited the bathroom while G laid on the ground in the fetal position. He had a gunshot wound in his stomach and additional uh, wounds near his hip. Lil Rod carried G to the ambulance while Diddy and Justin disappeared to another part of the studio. Diddy allegedly sent his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, to the police to tell him that G was shot outside by a drive-by assailant and forced Lil Rod to corroborate his story. Lil Rod also blames UMG for the lackluster security at Shallow Studios, which allowed Diddy or Justin to enter with a gun. Allegedly, Lil Rod was subjected to constant, unsolicited, and unauthorized groping of his genitals by Diddy during the 13 months while he lived with him. Allegedly, Diddy forced Lil Rod to work in the bathroom as Diddy walked around naked and showered in a clear glass enclosure. When Lil Rod brought this up to Christina Corum, she said, quote, you know, Sean will be Sean. Nice. And that Diddy's groping was kind of just his way of saying that he liked Lil Rod. Just fucking whack on every level. Lil Rod admired Stevie J, a producer for Diddy who won a Grammy on Diddy's debut album. And Diddy used his access to Steve J to groom and entice Lil Rod in homosexuality. He allegedly showed Lil Rod a video of a man he said was Stevie J having sex with a white male to ease Lil Rod's anxiety about engaging with him, engaging with homosexuality. And the video that Lil Rod provided seems to actually be of a famous gay porn star, but chances are Diddy still could have showed it to him and said that it was Stevie J. That whole part's a little confusing. But Diddy allegedly told Lil Rod that he had sex with an unnamed rapper probably Meek Mill for the same reasons we just mentioned above, and an unnamed R&B singer who's described as an R&B singer who performed at the Super Bowl and had a successful Vegas residency, which is probably Usher, and also Stevie J. Did he promise Little Rod that he would win producer of the year at the Grammys if he had sex with him? Lil Rod spent Thanksgiving 2022 with Diddy, his girlfriend Young Miami, and her female cousins. Did he allegedly offer Lil Rod cocaine and he declined before going to the bathroom? While Lil Rod used the bathroom, young Miami's unnamed cousin allegedly burst into the room and assaulted Lil Rod. She dropped to her knees and began performing oral sex on him. He pushed her out of the way and exited the bathroom. She followed him and undressed, straddled him, and attempted to have sex with him in front of Diddy and his family. Lil Rod believed that Diddy sent her to assault him, as Diddy allegedly laughed and egged her on throughout the whole ordeal. 
Throughout Little Rod's time with Diddy, he was transported from California to New York, Florida, and the Virgin Islands. He was allegedly forced to solicit sex workers and perform sex acts with them for the pleasure of Diddy. On February 4th, 2023, Diddy allegedly forced Little Rod to bring sex workers to his home in Miami. Little Rod believed that Diddy drugged him, and as Little Rod woke up naked, dizzy, and confused, he was in bed with two sex workers and Diddy, having no recollection of the previous night. When Lil Rod was sent to solicit sex workers, he wore an exclusive bad boy hat to various strip clubs, a signal to the sex workers that Diddy was in town and he wanted to recruit them. Diddy promised Lil Rod, producer of the year, $250,000, any instrument he wanted, and ownership of the $20 million property called One Star Island if he did what he asked. Diddy would also threaten Lil Rod if he said no. Diddy said he would eat Lil Rod's face and was willing to kill his own mother, Janice Combs, to get what he wanted. Which, my God, if that is true, that is some next level shit. Jesus. Diddy introduced Lil Rod to Cuba Gooding Jr. while recording in a makeshift studio aboard his yacht, and Diddy left them alone to, quote, get to know each other. Cuba then allegedly began touching Lil Rod along his legs and her thighs, groin, and lower back before Lil Rod pushed him away. Lil Rod was not adequately compensated for his work. Ultimately, Diddy paid him $29,000 for 13 months of full time work. Diddy also used vast amounts of weapons to threaten Lil Rod and bragged about shooting people. Allegedly, Diddy even claimed that he was responsible for the 1999 nightclub shooting that was pinned on Shine. Lil Rod also claimed that Diddy had Jennifer Lopez carry the pistol in her purse and that she handed Diddy the weapon after the fight with Scar broke out. Lil Rod also claimed that the CEOs mentioned in the lawsuits were not only aware of Diddy's crimes but facilitated and took part in them. Lucian Grange and Ethiopia Habter Mariam often visited Diddy at home and allegedly disappeared for hours in his bedroom. At parties they sponsored, specific bottles for men and women were given to the party goers, with the bottles for women being laced with ecstasy and other drugs. Both of these CEOs attended parties with sex workers and underage girls and allegedly knew exactly what was going on. Lil Rod alleges that Christina Coram is the Ghislaine Maxwell to Diddy's Jeffrey Epstein. Christina would openly order her staff to keep Diddy high at all times. Everyone carried a Prada fanny pack filled with cocaine, ecstasy, weed gummies, and Tucci, a mixture of cocaine and ecstasy for Diddy, so that he had his drug of choice at all times. Christina would allegedly be the one to orchestrate the solicitation of sex workers and facilitate freak-offs, and would always excuse Diddy's sexual harassment. Lil Rod allegedly witnessed Diddy distribute guns to questionable individuals dressed in all black. Lil Rod lists the following people as taking part in Diddy's alleged RICO enterprise. Stevie J would recruit sex workers and participate in freak-offs. Justin Combs would solicit sex workers and underage girls and would also perform in freak-offs. Brendan Paul was Diddy's mule who acquired guns and drugs for Diddy to distribute. Frankie Santella was employed by Bad Boy and worked with Brendan, carrying the cash while Brendan made the deals. This alleged RICO enterprise would allow the government to perform a more in-depth investigation into Diddy's criminal activities, as RICO laws were enacted to bring down the mafia. Lil Rod also alleged that Diddy had hidden cameras in every room of his homes, meaning he had thousands of hours of celebrities, executives, politicians, and athletes participating in freak-offs and illegal activity, which I think is probably true, and why Diddy's not all that worried. Because I am curious at who are all the names of people who have been mm-hmm. to his parties yep. or to his house. This is like wanting to know the flight log to Epstein Island. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Of course, Diddy denied all of these claims and did not settle. However, Lil Rod's lawsuit seems to have allowed the government to intervene. On March 25th, 2024, the Southern District of New York sent Homeland Security to raid Diddy's LA and Miami homes. And that was huge news. Everyone was talking about it. And they they did the raids, I believe, at the same time. Yeah. Fucking crazy. And hundreds of agents had flooded the street, many of them armed as they anticipated a potential standoff. Diddy's sons, Justin and Christian, were detained in handcuffs while authorities raided the properties. Diddy flew from L.A. to Miami, where he was recorded pacing nervously at the airport. And his alleged associate, Brendan Paul, was arrested at the airport for possession of cocaine. Authorities did not arrest anyone else, but walked away with a massive amount of electronic equipment, recordings, and firearms, which they're probably still going through all of that to this day. 
While Diddy was not arrested, the Southern District of New York confirmed that the raids were part of a sex trafficking investigation in which Diddy is likely the target. Diddy's plane flew from Miami to Antigua without Diddy on board, and it was grounded on the island and can no longer be publicly tracked. Last we heard, it was no longer on the airstrip. In the weeks since the raid, Diddy has been spotted around Miami looking like he's doing just fine. Seems to be in pretty good spirits. Again, authorities have not officially charged him with anything, and he's been seen multiple times in public since the raid. Here's a picture of him flashing a peace sign while riding his bike through Miami. His face just, like, pisses me off. Me too. Big dumb fuck. Can't stand his ass. I've always hated Diddy. Yeah, you always have. Me and Josh have always fucking hated him. Ever since that stupid TV show that we watched. (laughs) I knew you were going to bring that up. The Four. It's like his own version of American Idol. I couldn't stand him on there. He's such an arrogant, pompous dude. He fucked up. He didn't pick Javaya. Biggest mistake ever. No, but I I mean, we just hated him because we hated him. I had no idea about all of this. Now I really fucking hate him. Anyway, as of right now, we have no idea what's going to happen. As Little Rod alleged, authorities are building a case against Diddy and his Rico Enterprise. Prosecutors have reportedly questioned Cassie. Brandon Paul, who faces several years for cocaine possession, will possibly get flipped and turned a state's witness for a lesser sentence. However, Federal cases do take months to build. Who knows how long it's going to take, considering how much they probably have to go through. And Diddy has not been ordered to remain in the country. While additional lawsuits have been filed against Diddy's son, Christian, for sexually harassing a woman on board Diddy's yacht, it's likely things will be pretty quiet for the next couple months, although you never know what could happen. So now that we've kind of covered all of the alleged and also confirmed facts um, and legal trouble surrounding Diddy, we can discuss the rumors and theories about his shady dealings within the industry starting when he was an intern. Now, these claims primarily come from Gene Deal, who is Diddy's former bodyguard, and Jaguar Wright, who is Diddy's former assistant. And while we can't confirm it, their stories haven't changed. When Diddy was an intern under Andre Harrell, He allegedly had a sexual relationship with Andre to secure his rise within the company. Andre also had the same relationship with his mentor, Clive Davis, and soon Diddy became sexually involved with him too. Allegedly, when Clive Davis gave Diddy bad boy records months after he was fired from Uptown, that was because Clive replaced Andre with Diddy as his favorite protege and the sexual favors that included. According to Jaguar Wright, Kim Porter, who was then an assistant to Andre Harrell, walked in on Diddy performing oral sex on Andre. According to Kim's ex-spouse, Al B. Sure, Kim was threatening to write a tell-all book about her experience with Diddy right before she died. According to some, Diddy had killed her and told authorities to cover it up. Again, why this is, you know, pretty wild claims and possibly... Probably not true. I feel like we have to say that, but it wouldn't be shocking if it were true. Um, And it wouldn't be the first time that Diddy allegedly tried to kill someone and had it covered up. According to Albie Sher, Diddy had Kim poisoned with a relatively no trace substance. According to some online, the first autopsy, which can't be found, declared Kim's death a homicide. Then the man who performed the autopsy, Ed Winter, died too before the final autopsy was released months after her death. Albie Scher deleted posts where he alleged suspicions of Kim's death after he experienced multiple organ failure and survived a two-month coma. And even if Diddy didn't directly kill Kim, certainly he didn't help with her illness either. Two weeks before Kim's death, she had severe flu symptoms and a fever of 102 degrees Her son Quincy was attending a film premiere with Diddy and the rest of the family, and Diddy forced Kim to attend to portray this perfect blended family. And it's likely that if Kim did die due to illness, that that night only worsened her symptoms. Diddy and Kim's 13-year relationship was also tarnished with violence, abuse, and a potential death. While Kim and Diddy were not together, she had a romantic relationship with Def Jam executive Shakir Stewart. When Diddy learned about this while they were rekindling their relationship, Diddy allegedly broke Kim's nose and flew in a specialist plastic surgeon 
from Geneva to fix it. Months later, Diddy allegedly assaulted Shakir after tracking him down to his hotel room. Then paranoid in his own home, Shakir committed suicide with a handgun on November 1st, 2008. Of course, people believe Diddy had a hand in his death, though they're only rumors. The alleged sexual relationship between Diddy and Andre was commonplace for Diddy moving forward. He allegedly had the same setup with Usher, Justin Bieber, and any other musician or intern under his wing. While Justin hasn't come forward, people have noticed his strange demeanor in these two videos. Taken a year apart, many have noticed Justin's attitude change from excited to nervous, especially when Diddy asked why they don't hang out anymore. Let's take a look. Yeah, so as soon as you turn 16, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to let you rock this every time. Right here? Yeah, it's going to be yours. Let's... So I'm oh, telling you, okay. LA, it's a little dusty, but you know, we have put it the front shot in. Man. Get it. That power oh. dynamic once okay. again. Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to be driving this yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, when you get 16, you come down and you got to, you know, wear your seat. I mean, I'm 15. Back. You could ride in the passenger seat. I got my permit and all that. Not yet. Yeah. All right. 16. Not right. Let's slow down. Let's slow down, Jay. Okay. Let's slow down, okay? One, one step at a time. But, yeah, yeah, the keys is yours, and you, you know, when you get 16, you're right. good to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. All right, man. And then, when you get 18, you get the house. I get the mansion. Okay. I get the mansion. Yeah. yeah. So, where, where are we off to now? Where would you like to go? Um, I mean, wherever you want to go. Where are we going? <laughs> we just... So check this out, yo. Um, Justin, he's in, you ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 Hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, like, like the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, so we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, you know, I, I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he yeah. signed to Usher. I'm signed to Usher. Uh, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. I'm going crazy. Crazy. I'm taking this out tonight. What you want to do? What you want to do over the next 48 hours? 48 hours. Let's go on. Are we gonna let's just go get some girls? Let's go hang out some girls. A man after my heart. That's what I'm talking about. Shit. What the hell? So uncomfortable. Such a uh, What is going on, man? There's worse videos. So this is later on. Mm-hmm. What's up, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? Hey, right, young brother, everything's good. Definitely Selling right. out arenas and everything. Yeah. Starting to act different, huh? No, you, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you're I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, biz, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you, you never really got my number, so. Correct. Okay. My number? Yeah, 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 yeah. My, my number. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's five, five, five. Yes. Okay. Five, 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 five. Okay. Five, five. You heard that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm here to, um, because you've been a big supporter of mine, all yeah, jokes aside. Yeah, this this right here totally is my young brother right here. He's been a big supporter of mine. My album's coming out, and you know, we got the crew like going around now. You in New York City, yeah. and we got the Dirty Money crew, and we wanted to make you an official member of the Dirty Money crew. Are you all right? serious? There you go. That is Justin that Bieber. Is swag. This is your swag. Yeah, and then you got to do the swag walk, too. Okay. I got to show you the swag walk. Show me the swag walk. And Scooter, Scoot, Manager. Mogul or extraordinaire, got, you too. I just got much cooler. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Money. Dirty money. Okay, so when we walk down the streets of New York, we hit them like this. So me and you walk and we hanging out, you know, a little later on the night after the Usher concert. You know. Oh, get those ladies, right? Yeah, after that, the ladies, we in the street, Times Square. We go, swag. Swag. You see that? This, you see my hand right there? That's pushing the hate back. There's a lot of hate sometimes. Right, yeah. Swag. 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 Try it. So this hand? Yeah, hand. Okay. This hand. Push it back like you're pushing the wind back. Swag. Ooh. Ooh. You got it, son. You got it. That's right. My boy Bieber, official member of the Dirty Money Crew. All right, I'm chilling with my big bro, Diddy, right here. Got to gotta go get his album. It's Last Train to Paris. It is, you know, it's going to be the greatest album you've ever heard. It's got a lot of cool songs, a lot of people on it. You got yeah, Drake on there. Drake on there. Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. Chris Brown. Chris Brown. I wanted to do a song with you, but you was on tour. Usher. Song. Big yeah. Brother Usher. Big Brother Usher. So everybody's, everybody's on this album. Go get this album. 
Last Run to Paris. Yeah, get it. We're out. So he's using Justin Bieber to promote his album. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because he's a big bro. Yeah, trying to be. So who knows what's going on, really? Yeah. Very weird, though. Mm -hmm. Definitely, especially when you know everything that you know now. The fact that he was like, let's go get girls. I know. Yeah. What? Dude, he's, he's 15. That's such a weird. You're like, how old was he there? Did he like 40, 30, 40? Yeah, something like that probably. Fuck, dude. There's also this video that's been going around. I've only seen it on TikTok and it's not the best quality, but Justin seems sort of disoriented and he is underage in this video, I believe. So I wanted to just play it. I don't think we can play the sound because it'll probably be copyrighted, but this is Justin Bieber partying with P. Diddy and uh, many other men seeming very out of it. This is after he was given his jacket. Yes. So like right after the clip you just watched. Well, he looks different. He looks here, so it's... different, yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe he's definitely same, older But he here. has the same jacket on. Yeah, he's older here. He really does seem really out of it. Hmm. Yeah, I just, I don't know. It's hard to say, though. I mean, is there underage drinking going on, or is it more than that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, how can we really know? But yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than that. I don't know. God, I feel bad for Justin Bieber. Me too. There, I mean, there's a lot more to discuss with him, too, that we probably don't have time to get into today. But there have been some clips resurfacing lately about just kind of pe people who have straight up harassed him, uh, not just Diddy, but other celebrities throughout the years who've put him in like incredibly uncomfortable situations i know i had showed you a video of it recently um yeah i don't know i feel like there will be more that bieber has to say in the future if he can i don't know i think i think we're just like scratching the surface of all the fucked oh, yeah. up thing you know there's oh, there's yeah. just got to be so much more i'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we'll never see the light of day though there's probably really <sighs> probably. heinous stuff that we'll just never know about probably because it's either evidence has been destroyed or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those people never come forward but on march 29th 2024 this blind item appeared on the crazy days and nights blog known for discussing the weinstein abuse before it was publicly known uh, a quote said 15 years ago in this space it was pointed out how horrible the situation was between diddy and justin bieber no one cared no one did anything it is the same thing that has happened with every scandal no one does anything until finally a decade or two later when the number of people makes the seesaw fall that people finally say we didn't know. Yeah, you did know. You were just scared to say anything for fear it might hurt your career. Mm -hmm. Journalist Tori said that Diddy tried to pull the same thing with his family member when they were an intern. So we have a clip of that we'll show you here. I was personally disturbed many years ago. Okay, I, I, I know this man well enough to call him and say, hey, I need a favor. Yeah. And this might have been 10, 12 years ago that I called him and say, hey, I have a family member who I want you to hire them as an intern. Yeah. And uh, I have never talked about this publicly. And I and he said, yes. And they were flying around one of the interns, Atlanta, Miami, whatever, on the jet, in the house, whatever. And then the internship stopped abruptly, like three or four months into it. Yeah. And I spoke to my family member like well what happened and they wouldn't say yeah and i'm like what what do you why did it end he wouldn't yeah. say and years later they finally came out and this is a male yeah and said that uh puff had said come home stay the night with me or the internship is over and they said absolutely not he said absolutely not uh and the internship ended uh but from there i was like oh like this is this I is thought. how it goes okay yeah. okay so to hear that things went even further with potentially, allegedly, many other people. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not, I don't, it, you know, we, we feel like we've seen this coming. Yikes. Oof. Well, in 2018, porn actor Jonathan Odie was arrested after he allegedly shot up the Trump Hotel in Miami after hours. In a resurfaced police questioning footage, he requested a lighter sentence for providing evidence against Diddy. Jonathan claimed that he was a sex slave for Diddy and was kept on his property in Miami to engage in freak-offs on demand. This one obviously seems a little out there and Jonathan might just be crazy, but it's worth yep. including as Diddy would allegedly recruit sex workers for freak-offs and kept his favorite ones on payroll. I mean, personally, I would not be surprised if that is true. Yeah, definitely not. 
Tupac always claimed that Diddy was behind the quad record shooting. Diddy called him incessantly on his drive over as if he were trying to figure out his location. Keefe D, the gang member currently on trial for Tupac's murder, alleged that Diddy offered him $1 million to kill Tupac after the rapper embarrassed him at the Soul Train Awards. Eric Von Zipp, an associate of Diddy's, allegedly provided Keefe with the Glock 40 used to kill Tupac in Las Vegas. After the shooting, Diddy allegedly called Keefe and asked, was that us? Diddy wasn't implicated because he reportedly gave the million to Eric Von Zipp to give to Keefe, but he never did. Because he's, yeah. God. And Diddy might even be responsible for Biggie's murder as well. Diddy was pissed that Clive had gone over his head to send Biggie to London, and Biggie was thinking of leaving Bad Boy since he was becoming such a big star, and Diddy's contract held him back. Gene Deal alleged that Diddy sacrificed Biggie to end beef with the West Coast after Tupac's murder, and remember that Diddy forced Biggie to attend the after party that he was en route to when he was shot, potentially to give the shooters time and the location to kill Biggie. But why would Diddy sacrifice his most prominent artist and one of his best friends? Well, we have to go back to what he to- allegedly told Lil Rod, mm-hmm. that he would kill his own mother to get what he wanted. It's important to note that ex-LAPD cop Russell Poole lost his career for pointing out corrupt cops in the department. He died believing that Suge Knight ordered the hit using corrupt cops he was proven to have on payroll to kill Biggie. The FBI did an investigation into Biggie's murder, which the LAPD blocked, which is obviously suspicious. Biggie Small's mother sued the city of Los Angeles for $500 million in the city, wouldn't allow the FBI to testify during the hearings. While this lawsuit went nowhere, the LAPD was sued for $1.1 million for withholding and destroying evidence in the murder of Biggie Smalls. Sadly, we probably will never have the answers. To yeah. That oh, one. yeah. I highly doubt it. I mean, the corruption within the LAPD is uh, it's fucking deep, rampant, deep rooted. Yeah. Unbelievable. For many years. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I would not be sh- surprised if if Diddy was involved in both. I mean, it makes total sense. It really does. I mean, it's all about Diddy at the end of the day. He doesn't care. Well, to end off the episode, there are a few other clips from throughout the years. Actually, just two clips that really don't sit right when you know everything that we know now about Diddy. So let's take a look. We uh, we um we want to thank you. Come here. Don't don't sit on the bed. No, no homo. No, just just don't get close to the bed. Don't get up, but it's just like, yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man, man. You, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it. You did it. No, no, no. I definitely didn't have to do it. That's Kevin. Hart. I, I definitely, definitely didn't have to. Uh, first of all, I'm not giving the bag. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just going to, if we can, just let's, let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not, I don't want my shot to even, resist, like, I don't want it to come close to the bed at all. I, sh- I should look like he fresh off a goddamn plane. I just... <laughs> I just, I just, off the guard stage. That's sure. My brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause. But like, just out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like ten and I was a little bit older, his older brother. We used to fight over the over the frosted flakes. You know what I'm saying? Before pause was invented. <laughs> but it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the off of the frosted flakes because he used to always get up early. <laughs> yeah, the richest man yeah. in the world. Yo. What the fuck did Puff just say? Nobody's gonna count just for me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the frosted flakes, and we're streaming live. That was see that. Look at that. What the Look hell? at that aggression. Shut yeah. up, man. I don't know. Getting pissed. Yeah. All right. I I want to know what Usher knows. <laughs> don't we all? That's what I I want to hear from Usher because I mm, I bet he's dude. Got... There's so many people I want to hear from after all this. Ugh. God, it's disgusting. Well, there's so much more we could have gotten even more into. I mean, this was like, like I said, really scratching the surface of all of this. There's just so much. But I'm curious um, if you guys would like to see or to to listen to an episode, you know, an update later on as we hopefully learn more. Unless this once again. I think it's going to be a while, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be a while, but I'm just saying eventually. Yeah, I think it's going to be a while before we know more. We need to see this motherfucker behind bars, though. Sick bastard. God, this stuff about Cassie was just so disturbing. Yeah, just it's beyond words. Upsetting. No words. I mean, it's just yeah. it's just this dude's evil, man. He is. He's truly evil. Just evil. He's yep. a psychopath. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope they get him. I do too. I hope I do they get too. him. I hope I don't know. He's a weasel, man. 
He's got a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I want to know. I want to know everybody's thoughts out there because yeah, other you know like what what else do you think? Yeah, there is mm -hmm. you know to uncover. Yep, man. Yeah, this one's honestly kind of leave me speechless. I'm just kind of like digesting everything, and it's just so there's just so much, so much potential. Like to, I said, it's just so much worse than I ever could have imagined yeah. when all this kind of started coming out. Just God, these lawsuits were so. I just wonder, like, what's the extent and who's all involved? Like, I'm really wondering who's involved in the nefarious activities that he's how far does it all really go yeah, how, how deep do, does it yeah. go how many arms does this octopus have yeah mm. yep probably way more than we even know at this point There's but is this gonna be like fear, fearful to come forward i'm worried this is gonna end up like the epstein thing though it's yeah. all gonna be like That's hush hush was... brushed under the rug we like yeah just all went away it was like epstein was this huge story and then just overnight yep. it was gone he's yep. You know, dead, and then it just all disappeared, and we never found out anything really. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'll just see. Time will tell. Yes, it will. Well, that is going to be it for us this time. We for sure want to hear your thoughts on all of this. So let us know in the comments or head over to our Instagram at Mile Higher Pod and let us know your feedback there. Um, We'll be back next week to discuss another case, but until then, keep on taking your mind a mile higher.